Hey everyone, my name is Sarah Levon and welcome back to my YouTube channel. I am in an entirely new location right now. I am in the middle of nowhere in Wisconsin. There is a lake right here. I'm on family vacation, but I didn't want to leave you hanging. And so I am back for this month's coffee and questions. If you didn't realize, I did take a break last month just trying to set some boundaries for my life. But that doesn't mean that we're done because today I'm gonna to answer your questions from both YouTube comments and then from an Instagram poll. But before I get started, make sure you subscribe down below, give it a like, share it with a friend, and then let's get answering all of your questions. Before I get into your questions, I wanna let you know an update on my life. I have joined the VIP team for Ana Luisa Jewelry. If you haven't seen on a previous Coffee and Questions, I actually wore this necklace, which has become a staple of mine from Ana Luisa. If you haven't heard of them, they are a sustainable jewelry company. If you haven't seen already, I constantly am wearing jewelry all the time. I love switching out different pieces. And Ana Luisa, I have to say, they have so many options. Now, what's unique about Ana Luisa is to me, all of their jewelry is super like half dainty, half like unique pieces. And so what I like about that is that it doesn't have to be over the top. It can be simple and classy. They're also super sustainable, which I also love. And so today in honor of me being in the woods, I am wearing this woodsy collection of earrings, bracelet, and ring. I got the ring a little bit bigger. I always end up getting rings too small, so then they end up being on my ring finger, which I am single and ready to mingle. And so today I get to wear this one on my middle finger. I'm loving this set. It feels super appropriate for the outdoors. They have other sets. They have other individual pieces. They have layering pieces. So make sure you check out the description box down below for my link down there. Use the link. There's a promo code there, and it'll give you a discount off of your pieces. And then let me know what you chose what you have and we'll see if we have the same pieces because Lord knows I have a whole jewelry box full of their jewelry. Now without further ado let's get answering your questions. I put out a poll on Instagram so if you don't follow me on Instagram you can head on over to Bundle Birth and I ask you randomly throughout the months you sort of have to pay attention to stories in order to get your question through but I have a ton of responses. We're going to talk breastfeeding. I saw a bunch of pregnancy questions. I saw some trying to conceive questions. We'll see what happens and then I've actually prepared, which normally I don't prepare, <laughs> but this time I pulled your questions from YouTube and so I'm gonna answer your questions from YouTube. So let's actually start there. So this comes from my most recent coffee and questions where I talked about scheduling a C-section, why you can't produce breast milk and other things. So if you haven't seen this before, I have a whole lot of other coffee and questions. They're kind of nice to run in the background as you're doing other work, sort of ingest all of that pregnancy, birth, postpartum related information. So. With Coria Poniewozik says, hello, Sarah, I love your videos. I'm a second time pregnant and I feel like I could have used a lot of your information the first time around. Is there any way to check the baby's head position before breaking the water? With my first, they broke my waters and it turned out the baby was looking up or sunny side up or OP. I have three videos on this, by the way, so pay attention to those. I am not sure if they told me this before after breaking my waters, but I feel like if, it, if I gave it time, he could still turn inside and not end up with a vacuum intervention. So there's a whole lot going on in this question. If you have questions, I wanna let you know that I have a whole slew of childbirth classes online that talk you through literally everything you need to know along the way, including a vacuum, because I'm not gonna answer that question right now. That's not really a question. <laughs> so the question was, is there anything they can do or can they know what position your baby is in before breaking your water? And I'm gonna to add to this, does it matter? Because if it doesn't matter, then why would we need to know? So the answer is sort of, okay? That's my flex and flow of the first of the day. So sort of they can know, they could feel by your belly, they could technically do an ultrasound to know what position the baby is in. Here's where there is a flex and flow. Depending on if you're being induced or what's happening in your labor, if we're trying to weigh out breaking your water versus say a C-section or saying that like your cervix hasn't dilated anymore, uh, flex and flow, you're gonna have to weigh that out with your team. Now, sometimes too, you can't get the baby to move until the final piece. When we look at the statistics on what's called OP baby or occipit, back of the baby's head, posterior towards the back of you, towards your tailbone, which does technically kind of make your labor harder, 
that technically it doesn't really matter until the second stage, which you learn in my childbirth class, is when you're pushing. And so throughout labor, sometimes breaking your water, that's like the, that actually propels the baby forward. Sometimes it does cause problems, flex and flow, but the answer is yes, they can sort of know, and you can weigh that out with your care team based on what's happening with your labor. That one's sort of not like a super catch-all answer because it kind of depends on what's happening. So that's where flex and flow comes in. This to me is a really good question for us nurses out there. If you are a labor and delivery nurse, if you don't know, we have a whole community of labor and delivery nurses all over the world called Bundle Birth Nurses. You can look that up, but our little life says, hi, Sarah, I have a quick question for you. Moments after the birth of my son, the nurse told me I needed Pitocin and then gave me a shot in my upper thigh while I was being stitched up. At some point, I remember hearing going away I, or at some point, I remember my hearing going away and I got tunnel vision. I looked at my doula and could barely see her and I said, I think I'm passing out. And my head started falling back, but I fought it and was able to barely stay awake. They got me some juice and jello. After five minutes or so, I was okay. They told me I lost some blood and then the next day they put me on iron and told me I was anemic. Does it sound like I hemorrhaged? They never said a word or told me what I did, but I just assumed that's what happened. Or is it pretty normal to pass out after birth? I did pass out fully the next morning. Okay, so this is a loaded question. And the reason why I chose this one, because I think it is, um, there's a lot of little components that I can speak to. And I think just overarching, when you are reading comments or when you're watching blogs or when you're online and hearing or talking to somebody about their birth story, I think that there is a ton of, of scary stories out there, which there are, right? I've been a nurse for over 10 years and I have seen a whole lot. I could tell a lot of really interesting stories. Most of the time we're telling the more interesting stories than the more like it went perfectly and it was easy peasy and it was beautiful and the best day of my life. That's what I hope you're saying and you're also spreading the word on. And so when you hear st stories like this, I want to just alert you to take it in with a grain of salt, which means just say, hmm, interesting. Wow, that's a, that's a cool anecdote. I am so sorry that happened to you. But their story is not your story. This is why I've been in this industry for so long because no labor is exactly the same. And so with that, um, you know, I will address this hemorrhage situation, but I want you to be able to hear these stories and not totally take you down the stream of anxiety where you're freaking out and, oh my gosh, this is going to happen to me and this always happens. This does not always happen. It is not normal to pass out during your labor. That is not normal. I have actually seen more family members pass out than I have actually laboring people, which is some comes as a surprise to some. It is actually somewhat common, mind you, not normal or expected or wanted for you to pass out more often after your birth. Because of all the fluid shifts, you get up out of bed. This is why you're always asking for help to get out of bed for the first few times until you know that you're super stable, but that it's more common to pass out afterwards because of the blood loss and other things. So not normal during birth. It does sound like you, your blood pressure dropped significantly. So here's where I want to just touch on the nurse's side, because this is somebody who, um, I don't know how long ago she gave birth, but she's still ruminating on the fact that she doesn't know what happened during her birth. This is why if you are a medical professional, and I'm going to give you a tip if you're a patient as well, if you're a medical professional, it is so incredibly important. And we talk about this in our mentorship program. We talk about this on our podcast. We talk about this in, on the Instagram and on Physiologic Birth to debrief with your patient and tell them, hey, would you like me to recap what happened? Because what happens is naturally we fill in all the gaps. And if you're not a medical person, you don't actually know what happened. You're always going to fill them in with the worst case scenario. And so us as medical people, your nurse, your doctor, we can be there to help you translate, to help you understand what actually happened. And so nurses, be doing this. If you don't know how, come to Bundle Work Nurses Instagram or join us in mentorship and we will talk you through that. So the reason why they gave you Pitocin, my guess is there was a concern for blood loss because normally can you avoid Pitocin after birth? In theory, yes. Um, it is routine. It is recommended, but Absolutely, if that wasn't something that you wanted until they were bleeding too much, there was likely a concern for blood loss. Um, and again, whether or not you hemorrhage, I, that, that definition of a hemorrhage or bleeding too much is based entirely on how much blood loss they estimated or they quantified. And so if it was over, we're gonna say a thousand, 
milliliters in your vaginal birth, then technically that's a hemorrhage. After 500, previously that was considered a hemorrhage. And so either way, what we know is likely your blood pressure dropped. So maybe you lost a lot in a short amount of time and your body kind of like took a second to recover. That's also common, even if your blood loss wasn't a ton, okay? So I think it's safe to assume that you lost some extra blood. I don't know if it was considered a hemorrhage or not, but here's the final step, is that for those of you who have questions about your birth, you don't know what happened, you have gaps in the story, one, go to your provider and say, hey, I have some gaps. Go very specifically and ask, did I hemorrhage? What was my blood loss? If your doula was with you, this is something I always ask. What was the EBL or the QBL? estimated blood loss, quantified blood loss. And I can tell you that if you were to text me and be curious about this, if you had a doula, debrief with them, right? That talk through with your family, but get those questions asked because that is not an unreasonable question to ask your team to debrief with you. Okay, so this is actually from the same person, but I think it's also an important thing to discuss for nurses and for, and for patients. This is from my five tips you need to know for your postpartum experience for both mom and baby. Our little life says there was a very sweet, well-intending nurse in the NICU that came in while I was for the hundredth time that day attempting to get my baby to latch. So they're in the NICU. How many of you NICU mamas or parents out there are you? Let us know in the comments. Um, she saw me trying, and came over and said, want some help? Grabbed my boob and aggressively shoved it into my baby's mouth. I know sometimes they're rough with it because it, it can help the baby know it's there and latch a bit easier, but after maybe 30 seconds of him not taking it, she says, well, maybe you just weren't, to bre weren't meant to breastfeed. That's not okay. Um, is this really how nurses think? Doesn't breastfeeding normally take a lot of work, especially with NICU babies? We finally got him to latch without a shield after two months of working hard at it, and I had a wonderful breastfeeding journey for over a year and a half. Just to st ju I just had to stay diligent. Okay, so what I love about this comment as well is that sometimes, People will tell you things in the medical system, and this is the entire reason why I have bundle birth nurses, that we are trying to change this to watch our words, all right? This goes for a life experience, this is a life lesson, that when people tell us things, especially people that have no right in our lives, that have no credibility, that have not built any kind of meaningful relationship, one of my skills I'm currently working on is sort of just picking it up and letting it go and going, you know what, what's the truth? Is that the absolute truth? Can, would I bet my life on it? And if the answer is no, then we, as a skill for life, right, we sort of have to let things roll off our shoulders. Now, I am not blaming you because no one should tell you something so horrible when you're at your most vulnerable, especially in a NICU situation, but no matter what, you've just had a baby, breastfeeding is hard. Breastfeeding will be hard, expect that. And if it's easier for you, hallelujah, praise the Lord, I am so happy for you. But for the, for the most part, breastfeeding is a learning curve, especially when you have a NICU baby that presents all sorts of new challenges. And so um, doesn't breastfeeding normally take a lot of work, especially with NICU babies? The answer is yes. I am so sorry that someone said this to you. Nurses, let's consider what we're saying in, to these vulnerable families that are doing their absolute best, who are carrying so much weight through their labor, birth, parenting, and then especially in a NICU situation. And then is this really how nurses think? Um, I'm going to go with no. Okay, I'm gonna go and I really truly believe that your medical people that are taking care of you absolutely want your best. They are there to help you. They are there to support you. Now, have they been trained a certain way? Is there issues with the medical system in the United States? Absolutely. Are they always the most compassionate? Are they always on their best? No, right? And neither are all of us. So that's where sort of I'm asking for just a smidgen of grace and I hear that in you our little life. So that's not for you at all. I think that's just a challenge to all of us to give a little bit of grace, clarify, and then also I'm going to believe the best that like there are lots of medical people out there that will not treat you that way. And I'm so sorry once again that you were treated that way. Melissa Ferguson, this comes from my sister's birth story, which is the last one that I just posted. We did a live. We're also, if we haven't already, newsflash, we will be recording a live about her postpartum experience and breastfeeding tips. So make sure you stay tuned for that or look for it. Um, she says, random question, kind of pertaining to Hannah's story. I'm pregnant with baby number three, and my precious two babies came at first, 40 weeks and three days, second, 39 and six. Both were meconium babies where my second needed to be in the NICU for a week. Would getting induced be a good choice to possibly avoid meconium again? Okay. So that begs the question, what is meconium? I have an entire video on meconium. So that just means your baby pooped inside, which 
in general um, is not the end of the world, but it can pose complications such as in this case where the baby needed the NICU. So the question then was, would, be get it, would getting induced be a good choice to possibly avoid meconium again? So the one thing I will say to this, because there's a lot of nuances here, is that there is a higher chance for having meconium in your amniotic fluid or the baby pooping inside once you go past your due date, particularly at the 41 week mark. So maybe, but not necessarily. So that could be a choice that you decide, but I wouldn't necessarily base your induction strictly based on meconium because you can have meconium at really any stage of pregnancy due to the stress that is labor. That can also cause them to poop. So flex and flow on that one. Brittany Davenport says, I'm expecting baby number three, Lord willing, the baby flips, currently breached, but was with number two until 37 weeks. So keep that in mind, because that happens. I'm determined to labor at home as long as possible and go without another epidural since I was induced with the other two, both at 41 weeks. I have a four and a two-year-old at home. This is a very pertinent question. At what point in the laboring would you recommend I have someone come pick up my other two very active boys so I can focus? I've never had this question before, so I love it. Um, for reference, my first induction was 27 hours and my second was 11 and a half, three hours of active labor. Okay, so for if you're induced, obviously that's an easy answer. You're gonna have them be picked up when you go to the hospital. But if you go into labor, here's two quick answers to this. One is if your water breaks, call them and start moving your way in. It's your third baby. The third baby is entirely the wild card. And so it may go fast, it may go slow, flex and flow, but in general, it, you sort of expect it to go kind of like the second. The other thing would be if you're having contractions. Now, I always say labor establishes itself. I think second time parents, or if you've had a baby before that you're, you've heard so many times that you're gonna deliver in the car or that it goes so fast. And so a lot of times people are almost more hyper about going to the hospital too early. And so with that, I would say that remember that labor still happens, right? That you're having some Braxton Hicks, that things are like, ow, ooh, ooh. I'm waiting for them to become regular and, and regular in strength and frequency. I teach you all of this in my labor prep class. I make it so simple for you. So make sure you check out the, the box down below because I have all that information down there for you to take all your childbirth classes. But with that, once they're regular and they're sort of starting to like, where you're breathing through them, they're starting to take your mindset, then I would say, like, even if they're sort of irregular, once they're regular to the point of five minutes apart and uncomfortable versus like, ooh, ouch, then you're calling someone. Better safe than sorry, because once you hit that active labor mark, as you saw with your, your second, I think it was, where you said it was three hours, that like three hours, to be honest, is a lot of time, but it's also not a lot of time when you're waiting for people to come, you're doing the, the transfer to the hospital, you're getting admitted to the hospital. If you want an epidural, you get an epidural, and then baby, right? That things can go pretty quickly once they start going. So I would say that once things start where you're huffing and puffing or you're finding that they're more annoying, distracting, you have a sense this is it. I think I just want to be able to be free to move around and yell and scream or moan or do whatever you got to do, then call them in. T Hall, this comes from my last coffee and questions. So if you're really trying to get a question answered, comment on this one. I always go back to the coffee and questions and pull those first. She says she has an ex a question for me. Is it normal for the baby's heart rate to drop right before delivery? Both my babies were born healthy, but also had a heart rate drops right before the big push to get them out. Doctors and nurses tell me I had to push now to get my babies out. It was really scary in the middle of it. Is it normal for this to happen? First was born with a cord around the neck, but second wasn't. Now I'm pregnant with my third, wondering if I can expect that again. Okay. Heart rate issues, I talk all about this in my medical interventions class, but to give you the snippet is you have heart rate monitors on your belly. We are watching the whole time. You're in the hospital watching for issues. That's how we know baby's doing okay. That's how we know that they're getting enough oxygen. As your baby's head gets smushed, it is normal. It is a physiological response for the heart rate to drop. Okay. Now, if it, especially as it drops with contractions, we're like, oh, the baby's head's getting smushed. Woohoo. That's what we love. That's what we're waiting for. It has no significant outcome on your baby. Now, can the heart rate drop in other ways? Absolutely. And this is where I'm going to leave it to your nurses. I'm going to leave it to their fetal monitoring certifications, exams. We do tons of work to understand and interpret fetal monitoring, okay? So as you see it there, just know we're always watching, we're paying attention, we're making sure everything's okay, but it is normal loosely, this is flex and flow, okay? But it is normal for the heart rate to drop a little bit, especially at the end, as and if there's rapid descent, 
that can be a significant stressor on the baby. Sometimes you see that. If there's a cord, and you saw it with your first, that there was a cord around the neck, and so that cord around the neck, what it did was it probably pulled a little bit, and so as the baby came out, pulled on the cord, we expect the heart rate to drop that way. Throughout your labor, it is extremely normal for there to be some heart rate fluctuations, right? That is normal, that's what we're watching for. So long as the heart rate comes back up, we're good to go, we're gonna keep watching it. And we're watching for there to be signs that the baby's oxygenation is compromised or that there is a decrease in oxygen to blood flow to the baby that we care about. Now, over a long period of time, we really care about it. Throughout your labor, your team is gonna be watching the heart rate. They will adjust. Most of the time, it means nothing. Just like you saw with both of your babies, you were able to deliver vaginally. It can be stressful at the end. That's why you have a provider watching and saying, hey, it's time. We got to get this baby out. I'm sorry that it resulted in a vacuum if that's not what you wanted, but I'm so glad that everybody is okay. And, um, and for those of you out there, like this is sort of to be expected. And so that's where one of my prompting questions, this is a total tip for you, is just, hey, can you help me understand what's happening with the heart rate? I noticed that you are all stressed in the room. Can you help me understand what's happening here? Tell me what this means. Are we long-term concerned or is this something short-term that we've fixed? Those kind of questions to help you understand if no one's explaining to you, they should, that's their job, but make sure you're prompting them if you don't have that information. Okay, let's go to Instagram because I feel like that was a long time that I was talking. There are so many good questions, so make sure you comment down below of this in order for me to be able to answer your questions. So I'm gonna go here. I have no idea what's here, and I'm just gonna wing it with some of your Instagram questions per usual. So I'm gonna start with Lauren Lutt because there were multiple questions about what happens at your prenatal visits. And I think this is actually something that I, I maybe should do a YouTube video on and I can talk through each one. But in general, they're gonna be different, okay? It totally depends on your gestational age. That's how pregnant you are, how many weeks you are in the prenatal world. We go by weeks, less than months. That gives us much more an understanding what to expect. So first couple, you can expect a transvaginal ultrasound, so a wand up your vagina. Sometimes they'll do it on the outside, depending on the doctor, but they are looking for your baby. Throughout, they will do occasional ultrasounds. A lot of times they'll measure your belly. They're always gonna take your vital signs. They're always gonna take your weight. They're always gonna ask you some questions about your pregnancy, any new symptoms, what's going on. Throughout, you will have some labs taken or they're gonna suggest to take some labs, which means some blood tests just from your vein and then they send that to the lab to track some of that throughout your pregnancy. At some point, you'll do a gestational diabetes test that's usually 28 to 32 weeks where they you throw back some like sugary water stuff and then they test your blood sugar with that. There's a GBS swab towards the end. And so for the most part, we're looking at asking you some questions, talking about your new symptoms, vital signs, weight, measuring your belly, sometimes an ultrasound. Now at 20 weeks, you'll do an anatomy scan, which is like a really long ultrasound. So bring your phone or your phone charger or a magazine or something to look at because that one takes a while. Um, and then some lab testings throughout. And then towards the end of your pregnancy, they may suggest checking your cervix, which is a vaginal exam or two fingers up your vagina to see what's going on with your cervix. I teach more about that in multiple of my YouTube videos and in my childbirth class. I feel like this has been one big commercial for my childbirth class, but it's all in there for you to reference if you want more. Uh, I hope that answers your question. That is like the very basic overview, um, but you can also ask your provider if they have a rundown of what happens throughout your pregnancies. This is in my birth coaching class. So let me know if you want this as like a PDF download or something. Maybe I'll give you a like what to expect PDF download on my site or something. Let me know if you want it and I can make it. Okay. Tony Louise says, second baby, why do Braxton Hicks hurt so much? I had a C-section for the first baby. I'm only I'm only small and have a heart-shaped uterus. Okay, so there that could be there could be an anatomical issue going on, or you might have some sort of scar tissue from your cesarean, which is my first sort of thought. Again, I don't know. I don't, I'm not, I don't have a magic ball with your uterus, but I will say there's two sides of the story. There could be scar tissue or what we call adhesions, that when the, the uterus was healing after the surgery, that the body goes, ooh, let me heal you. And instead they create like 
some like restriction and scar tissue there so that when you do have a little bit of a contraction because a Braxton Hicks is just a contraction, just that's not changing your cervix. And so when that happens, it kind of pulls on those adhesions, it pulls on the scar tissue and could cause some more contractions. The other side of this is sometimes Braxton Hicks just hurt. Right, and as long as they're not super regular, as long as they're not getting stronger and stronger, closer and closer together, they're still Braxton Hicks. Braxton Hicks is a contraction. It's just not changing your cervix, which I talk about in all of my cervical dilation or my what is labor videos along the way. You can check those out. Oh yes, Lindsay Crump, postpartum hair loss info. My baby is five months and I feel like I'm balding. Hair's fa hair falls out in clumps. Who knows all about this? This is actually extremely common and it's extremely normal. Now, if you are truly pulling out hair to the point where you have like bald spots in your head, that's separate. But you, throughout your pregnancy, typically people find that their hair, skin and nails improves, that you get thicker, more luscious hair. And so it's sort of in preparation for losing the hair as your hormones start to shift. This does happen months after. So this is why I, think is another perfect example why postpartum needs to be a whole year long. Don't get me on that soapbox. But the idea is that as long as you're not balding, balding, I promise you, it's just a part of the process. It will thin out and then it will come back in. That's where they say like the little baby hairs because you do have, I have them and I have, I'm not postpartum, <laughs> but you can see like the little breakage based on your hair growing back in. Vita prenatal vitamins are really good to continue taking. Biotin's good as well. A lot of times some of the same stuff in biotin is in your prenatal vitamin, Flex and Flow. You can talk to your provider about it. And then, um, I mean like regular scalp simulation, you can do scalp massage, but even that, that might actually accelerate the hair loss. And so that's where I would just say, kind of let it run its course, knowing that it's a part of the postpartum experience. Ooh, Peyton Neorger <laughs> says, how long after vaginal delivery do you have to wait for a tubal ligation? So a tubal ligation is when you tie your tubes. For No More Baby, it is permanent sterilization. It is sort of reversible, sort of, I say that super, super loosely, because if you're getting your tubes tied, you wanna be done having babies, no chance going back. It's very uncommon for people to untie their tubes once they've been tied. And they're not actually tied, they're like snipped and sutured, but either way, it doesn't matter, for the sake of permanent birth control. So um, this is gonna be case by case, my guess is, now, Actually, I'm gonna backtrack because if you have a C-section, you wanna have your papers signed because they can do it so easy. You would know no difference. It is like the quickest extra five minutes of your entire surgery for them to tie your tubes when you're in a C-section. So I always say if it's a consideration not to set you up for C-section, but just in case, you would hate to go in for a C-section and then be able to be done and then have to go in for another surgery, okay? The other surgery for tubal ligation, it's usually an outpatient surgery. They do a little incision on your belly button, band-aid after a couple little stitches, um, reach in, tie, 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 30 minute procedure, no big deal. Some people do it immediately postpartum in the hospital, okay? One of my first hospitals did this, where they'd go to postpartum for 24 hours, they would come back to labor and delivery, tie their tubes, send them home, okay? So this is where it's gonna be very provider specific. Some people like to wait a full six weeks afterwards. Um, talk to your provider because I've seen it done immediately after, which is really nice because you're not doing a whole nother hospital stay and then you don't have to worry about birth control going into the future. Okay, I love this one because this I think is so relatable and I want to free you up in your breastfeeding journeys. All right, ready? So Anna Van Johnson says, new mom here, I'm overwhelmed by the mixed information. How many of you are overwhelmed by mixed information? That's why you're here, right? Is it good to let your baby sleep or do I have to wake them up to feed? Baby's gaining weight and has plenty of wet diapers. Oh, and she's four weeks. You just gave me like the three informations that I need. So when we are talking about how much your baby should feed, in general, we're talking eight to 12 times in a 24 hour period, 24 hours, not every two to three hours on the dot. It could be every hour during the day, an hour, two hours, four, five, one, two, three, two, right? None of that matters so long as they're eating around eight to 12 times in a 24 hour period. Now that's how we, that's like the number we land on to help you know your baby's getting enough. But how do we actually know your baby's getting enough? Is exactly what you just told me and you know you're smart, is you're, you have enough wet and dirty diapers and that your baby is gaining weight. If those two things are happening, you are fine. Especially at four weeks old, do not wake up your baby. Live your life, sleep. If they give you five hours at night, amazing. If they give you six hours at night, 
amazing so long as you have those wet and dirty diapers and I have an Instagram post about this where you can save it to your like your little saved things on Instagram to know how many diapers you should be getting based on age of life um, based on formula and breast milk and all of the above okay so deep breath all of you who are stressed out about waking up all night sleep if they if slash when they wake you up to feed feed them, give them a good feed, and then go from there. I will say my sister's breastfeeding right now and she'll sleep four or five hours and totally fine. She's gaining so much weight. She was back to birth weight in a hot second. And still to this, like we can literally see the weight gaining on her face. She feels heavier and she is peeing and pooping all day long, full saturated diapers. That's what we want. We got really full diapers. If they're doing that, they're getting enough. Okay. So deep breath all as well. One more, and this one's gonna be for nurses. I feel like it's fun to throw in like a little nursey one. For those of you that aren't nurses, stay tuned because you get the little insider scoop on what your staff or those caring for you are really feeling. Um, Hammer Chris, Chris Hammer, I see you and I know, I think you just signed up for our mentorship program. We are so excited to have you. He says, what is something new grads in labor and delivery can focus on to be most successful on the floor? I love this. We give you 12 months of that coming in your mentorship. Um, I don't know if I could land on one, but the one that comes to my mind that I wish I would have known and done better slash been told was build relationships with your coworkers. Okay. Of course, build relationships with the patients, but when push comes to shove, labor and delivery is a team sport and everybody has their, re their respectful roles. And when you have allies on the floor and you have those relationships, they will carry you through for a long, successful career. People don't leave labor and delivery because they hate the work. They leave labor and delivery because of the people that they work with or the staffing, <laughs> right? And when staffing is hard, if you love your coworkers, it's like, yeah, we overcame a crazy night and you feel better about it, right? Now, along those lines also comes your doctors, okay? That to learn your doctors, I wish someone would have told me there is a boat coming, so let me pause, it's about to get really loud. I wish I would have understood the importance of building meaningful relationships with doctors. So when you're at the nurse's station, hey, help me debrief this case. Do you have a moment, could we talk about that? I have a question for you. At, be a learner with your providers and sort of, we're not stroking egos here, but we're learning from their expertise when you're new. Capitalize on being new because you can't always say like, I'm new, I'm just learning, when like you're not forever new, right? Like now, if I were to say that, people would be like, okay. I'm over that stage, right? So take advantage of that and then get to know your doctors because also having them as an ally and being able to work collaboratively is one, gonna make you a lot happier in your job and then your patients are gonna receive better care and less stress in the room and you'll be able to kind of navigate the scenario a lot more delicately. A lot of labor and delivery is interpersonal. So get to know your coworkers and build relationships with them. Thanks everyone for being with me here today. If you want more from me, you've heard it a few times, but check out the description box down below. Make sure you check out Ana Luisa and I have a promo code down there and check out their website. Scroll around, look for your favorite piece. Let me know what your favorite piece is. They also, I will mention, they have a mama necklace that I have featured in a previous video as a perfect gift for those of you out there who either wanna represent being a mama if you identify that way, or for those of your mama friends as a great baby shower gift. It's such a thoughtful thing. They also, they last forever and they are such high quality and like heavy. So it feels like a really luxurious gift when it still is super affordable. Everything starts at like $39. Anyway, check out the description box for that. Thank you for being here with me today. If you have other questions, comments, concerns, comment in the, in the comment box down below. Make sure you subscribe, give it a like, share it with a friend. Follow me on Instagram, and then until next time, don't forget to flex and flow, and I will see you soon. Bye. We just have to do a quick cameo for coffee and questions. Can you say hi? Hi, guys. This is it's all worth it. When they come like this, you have the funniest face on right now. Yeah? Okay. Say bye. Yeah, you can do it. You got it. And then I'll just be breastfeeding up a storm. Cute. You're so alert right now. I'm the best. What do you think? Hmm? Yeah. Mwah. Mwah. Oh, you see the birdies? Do you hear them? Say hey, bye. Bye bye.